it's okay to ask for things. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We're taught that we're just not okay. We're taught to be polite. It's so fun, especially for women. I mm -hmm. think that women have such a hard time with that of like, there's something wrong with you saying you need something. I in think business that's too, so right? fucked up in everything. Okay, it is Thursday, November 3rd, 2022. This is the Token CEO Podcast. I'm Erica. I'm the CEO of Barstool Sports. Thank you for watching this and listening to this. We are so grateful. If you want to leave us a rating or give us a review, we will have you call in to Work Like a Girl where I answer every work question you could possibly have or I stupidly agree to review your resume, which is pretty much all I did this week. So we've got a great show today. We've got Liz Goldwyn joining us. She has written a book called Sex, Health, and Consciousness. She is the founder and the CEO of a company called The Sex Ed, and she runs a really interesting business that is helping educate people about sex, how to talk about sex, how to set boundaries around sex, how to communicate with your partner about sex, all sorts of things, sex, sex, sex related. This is not going to be as good as Mean Girl or call her daddy, but we get some interesting tips and we are appreciative for them. Before we get into it, want to say thank you to Omega Accounting Solutions. Omega Accounting Solutions, they're awesome because they take care of all of the accounting needs for small businesses. So one of the biggest secrets out there is that big companies hire big accounting firms and they get to jump through every tax loophole imaginable. They get every tax benefit, every tax credit out there, and the little guys don't get to take advantage. So what's great about Omega Accounting Solutions is they help small businesses get the tax credits they deserve. So if you call 1-800-704-2000, that's 1-800-704-2000, or if you go to omegataxcredits.com, you can learn more. All right, so we're going to start. We're going to talk to Liz Goldwyn. She's awesome, super interesting. I actually could have talked to her for a long time. She talks about her book. She talks about what she does at the Sex Ed, and she talks about how we can all be better about communication and boundaries. I thought the, one of the most interesting things in the conversation is that most people are getting cues about sex, learning about sex, getting in, um, an interpretation of sex from porn and from the internet, which is, as you can imagine, insanely unhealthy. So she's helping women and young people and just frankly, actually people in general combat that. So let's talk to Liz. Okay, Liz, I have a thousand things to talk about. So first though, why don't I let you introduce yourself? Like, who are you? What do you do? And why do people need to know you? I'm Liz Goldwyn. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm the founder of The Sex Ed, which is a multimedia site and podcast for sex, health, and consciousness education. And I'm an author in my new book. Which we have. Sex, Health, and Consciousness is out now, which covers yeah. a lot of topics. The total reimagining of how you think, talk, and communicate in general about sex. about sex, how you have sex. So one thing that I love that you talk about, Liz, is how distorted, well, I, it's so, sex is such a crazy topic, interesting topic, but how distorted young people's views are of sex by virtue of how they're learning about it and experiencing it, which is mostly digital. Mm -hmm. Like talk about that a little bit. Like where, where do you, actually, sorry, let me take a step back. Where do you think it goes wrong in how people feel, think, and talk about sex? Gosh. That's, that's like a whole show. Yeah, in there's a, that's a whole show. I mean, I think all of us have a lot of relearning to do mm -hmm. when it comes to sex, because when we think back to our first experiences, um, we weren't actually taught to like love ourselves mm -hmm. and our bodies and about pleasure yep. before giving that agency to other people, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. for women. Yep. Um, and most of the people who taught us about sex have a lot of fear and shame yep. and trauma around sex. Most of us do. Mm -hmm. And we're so freaked out about talking about it, yet it rules all of our decision-making yeah. process, literally, from like the clothes we wear to the choices we make to what we drink or don't drink yep. or, you know, how, how you act, how, how you behave, act. where you go. Every single thing. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to talk about it. Yeah. That's it's, funny. It's, we're obsessed with it. But the only thing we can, the only time we actually talk about it is like clickbait yeah. around like so-and-so sexting scandal, yep. you know? Yep. Um, so yeah, I think we have to like basically relearn yep. about sex no matter what age you are. 
And because we're learning about it now, largely through the internet or through streaming porn, we don't have any like porn literacy mm -hmm. to like understand that what we're seeing on camera isn't real. Yeah. Performers are paid. They negotiate consent and boundaries before. And it's not like you would hmm, watch. You never know that. Uh, you don't know that. As yeah, a you consumer. don't know that. Yeah, you don't know that as a consumer. It's like you don't go and watch like Top Gun or Mission Impossible and think I can jump out of a helicopter. Yeah, I'm, I'm a great pilot. Yeah, I can drive I can a be car a great backwards. Pilot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like you watch porn and you think, especially for men, yeah. I think it's really creates a lot of performance anxiety mm. because they think like my dick needs to get hard yeah. like that. I can keep it up, you know, yeah. for this long. Actually, the rise in erectile dysfunction and ejaculatory disorder is directly correlated to the rise in streaming porn. When really? When we look at like research from like huh. mid 90s to now. It's because like, it, set a, it set an expectation of how it's supposed to it go. It set an expectation. It sets an expectation for everyone. Yep. Um, and like, I guess, yeah, for me, I take it for granted because I'm in this space. Yep. Like, of course they negotiate consent and boundaries, yeah. but like, you don't just, I think a lot of people learn things like, for example, choking. Yeah. Okay. That you may learn in porn. You don't choke someone when you're not facing them, for example, mm -hmm. because you don't know if they're turning blue. Yeah. And so there's all these things that we don't talk about. And that, like, people actually, the funny thing. It's really thing, important to cover. so important. And also the funny thing is people are super willing to, like, exchange bodily fluids, but they're totally freaked out yeah, about talking to actually about it. talk about it yeah. before you have sex. Yeah. Which is, like, insane. Yeah. To think that you will lick someone else's orifices, but you can't just say. You can't say, talk about, like, what you like or how you like it or where you feel safe or exactly. what the safe word is. Exactly. Interesting. And I have so many, especially, um, like, girls in their 20s tell me that they wish that they could be open about saying like, I just want to call the next day. I just want to text the next day. I just want like some basic human politeness. Like I just gave you a blow job. Yeah. Like just you, text me back. Just text me. It doesn't mean that you need to like. We're not going to get married. We're not going to yeah. get married. As we're not going to have a relationship. relationship status. It's like just acknowledge yeah. fucking human politeness. Hmm. I think. What do you think? Like what's your best advice for women going into about to have sex like if you were to if you're talking about raising consciousness and empowerment like what's your go-to advice I would say practice having an awkward conversation first with like your friends okay with people you trust but, I yeah. would suggest that you have the conversation when you're clothed okay. like not when you're like in the heat of the moment yep. and like beforehand yeah because it's actually really hot to talk about yeah, it's what kind of, you want to like do and yeah. what you like to do yep. and if we can take some tips from like the kink or fetish scene, mm -hmm. which are more extreme, mm -hmm. is more extreme sex, they really talk about things beforehand hmm. and create a safe container so you can let your freak flag fly. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because the safer that you feel, the more you can let go. Yeah, that's right. And also, I think what you're saying is that talking about boundaries can actually be sexy. It's super sexy. Yeah. Here's what I like. Here's what I don't like. Yeah. And like, what do, what you, do you like? What do you like? Yeah. Okay. And you can try to look at the your, the person in their left eye, if mm. you can, because let's see, I'm so bad. I always have to do this. The, the left and the right same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's your left. Okay. Look okay. At, yeah. So I'm going to look at you in your left okay. eye. Because, Why? Because uh, in your parasympathetic nervous system and neuroscience shows that that's like a more direct route to your subconscious. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm so like left this side. Yeah. So left brained. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So have the conversations when you're clothed, have them when you're sober. Yep. Yeah, that's that's important. And you can be sexy in having the conversation, but I be think, clear. Yeah, I think clarity is really good because I think that's what makes us, especially as women, feel sometimes like uncomfortable or we're not getting our needs met mm -hmm. um, when we don't voice. And it's also, I think so many people feel like, oh, it's so awkward to say it, but that's why I'm suggesting practice with a friend. Mm -hmm. like, that's smart. You know, even in your, I think even in like platonic relationships, it's also good to have yeah. these conversations and just name your needs. Mm -hmm. like hey, I really need to know that what I tell you stays private. Yeah, that's right. You know? Yep. It's or like very simple. I really need a hug after we have sex. A hundred percent. Like just need a hug. Uh, well, so there's something called aftercare. 
Oh, okay. In, in kink and fetish. Okay, but, but not in regular sex? I think we need to bring aftercare. Oh, okay, into, let's, like, let's talk about it, Liz. Into vanilla. What's aftercare? Okay, so aftercare is basically this idea that you and I have just had like a scene, which is what they would call like a... An encounter. An encounter, right? Okay. And that could include something that's like potentially really heavy, like bondage okay. or handcuffs. And so there's some... So we know that when you have an orgasm or we have sex, you don't feel the same way before or after, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like being high. Yeah. Like you're a little bit out of body yeah, or you're, altered state you're of kind consciousness. Kind of dreamy. Yeah. So it takes something to like come back down your equilibrium. Okay. To like come back to like your normal to earth. state. Yep. Right. So aftercare is what we would discuss in advance about what you need and what I need. Okay. To come back to that. Okay. So that would may mean I need a hug. Okay. I need cuddling. Okay. Like in kink or fetish, it could literally be like wiping someone down, giving them water, okay. like petting their head. Just I need like, to be fed or whatever. Whatever yeah. it is. Like okay. I need a fucking banana. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, need, I need to wear some sweatpants. Yeah, whatever. Whatever yeah. it is. It's all good. So let's say that you were someone who needed that cuddling. Yeah. But I'm someone who feels super smothered. Yeah. You're like, don't cuddle sex. me. Yeah. Like, I want to be left alone. We, I'm hot. I'm in my bed. I'm yeah, hot. Don't touch me. Exactly. So, yeah. But if we discuss that in advance. Yeah. Then like, I don't feel alienated. Mm -hmm. when you're like don't you touch don't, me you don't feel like rejected by yeah. me and i'm able to give you like what you need yep. and we discuss it and so that the aftercare thing here let's go back to what i said about i need a text afterwards yep that could be considered aftercare for sure it could be totally normal just to say hey i'm gonna go down on you i'm gonna give you the best blow job of your life ever but, but <laughs> before i give you that pleasure I just need you to check in with me 24 yeah. hours within 24 hours and just so I feel like we're human beings yeah. that have like a basic have respect some type and of kindness connection. for each other. Yep. That's so that that's how I, I love that. translate aftercare. I just think it's like a no-brainer. Hmm. What are other things do you think from what do you call it kink and fetish or kinky fetish or what what are things that it could also translate? Like Commun what do you think communicate 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 boundaries boundaries boundaries. Mm -hmm. Those are like, I would say out of all the questions that we get at the sex ed and that I get personally, like always and, about those two things. Well, the answer to all of them hmm. generally is coming down to some form of communication yep. and some form of like saying your boundaries. Like it's okay to ask for things. Yeah. It's okay. Yep. We're taught that it's, it's not okay. We're taught to be polite. It's so fun, especially for women. I mm -hmm. think that women have such a hard time with that of like, there's something wrong with you saying you need something. I in think business that's too, so right? fucked up in, in everything. Yeah. In everything. It's like the Meg Ryan orgasm salad thing. And when Harry met Sally, which anyone who listens to this is too young, they're not even going to know what that is. But that's basically faking your orgasms, which we've all done. Yes. Which doesn't do any service. I literally write about in the book, there's a guy I know who's like kind of famous. Okay. And he was in a long-term relationship and they broke up he was in his early thirties. And he was like, I don't know how I'm going to like meet someone else. Like we came together every single time. And the, I'm like, oh no, honey. Yeah, you we did, didn't. You didn't come together. <laughs> Actually, we time. didn't. Yeah, you so did. Like, yeah, he's walking around thinking that he's like the best lover yep. to ever exist. Yeah, that's and right. And she's like, oh my god, I got rid of that guy. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it doesn't really do either of them a Justice. service, yeah. right? Yep. Because like potentially, like she could increase her mm -hmm. pleasure, and he could like learn more about the clitoris, for yeah, example. Yeah, that's right. So what's your advice to people on how they should ask what they want and also how they tell people what they don't like? Well, I would say don't start it with, I don't like when you, okay. Like you always want to make it, you always want to make it positive. Yeah. Yeah. I really like having my nipples sucked. Okay. You could say. Yeah. Um, I'm not really into when you pull them. Yeah. Okay. Great. Is like, you know, I think it's like not as complicated as people yeah. think it is. It's pretty is. basic. Yeah. I guess like for me, business was something I really had to learn because I didn't have training mm -hmm. to be a CEO. I didn't go to business sure. school. So I had that level of awkwardness mm -hmm. in that space. And having the same conversation about when you talk over me in a meeting, <laughs> you know, I, I the best way for me to engage in a meeting is this. It would be helpful for me if you would do that or whatever. But it's not that different. Yeah, it's not that different. It's not that different. Luckily, I work with a lot of women. So yeah, there's not so as much so talking lucky. over. Yep. Um, and it's interesting to me that you say that there's, you know, I always tend to be biased towards like it's harder for women to have the conversation or women have 
more pressure to fake an orgasm or to, um, you know, ha have body dysmorphia or feel like you're too fat or not sexy enough or you're not good enough in bed or whatever. But it's interesting that you say that it, it applies to men too. hundred percent. I think we need to be creating more spaces that are inclusive for men, especially straight men, mm -hmm. um, who right now, like culturally are feeling alienated yep. and feeling like their voices hmm. don't matter and they're afraid yep. because there's such a learning curve for them to keep up with. Yep. And they don't have spaces to be nurtured. Yeah and to talk about their feelings yeah. and, be and to vulnerable. be vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. and vulnerability is so sexy yeah, and absolutely. it's actually such a, a power skill yeah, that's to right. have. Um, so yeah, I think men are facing, I mean, think about it, women, we have so many ways to like talk to each other sure. and get support. Yeah. And men still don't have they that. They don't have that. And they're only really allowed to cry when their sports team loses <laughs> or when like a famous yes. athlete dies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Like that's the only time mm. that it's like okay for them to grieve. To have real emotion. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's interesting. And I think I constantly have to remind heterosexual women in long-term relationships that men have feelings. Really? I swear to God. Like it's shocking to me. Like women who I would think are like pretty evolved or, you know, like successful women. Yep. Are like, hey, men have feelings. Yeah. They have feelings Listen. too. Yeah. And they have insecurities about yeah. their bodies and they're being told. I write about this in the book too. There's like all these myths about what's like normal. Mm -hmm. And so there's like kid boys learn at an early age that like their dick should be a certain size. I know. Yeah. It's so sad. Which is, by the way, they're, they're measuring their normal against like not actually what the average is yeah. for yep. penis size. What's the average penis size? So they think it's like eight inches. Yeah. It's not eight inches. Yeah. It's closer to like 4.7. Okay. Yeah. Slightly exaggerated. Which but slightly, that's, hard. that's almost double. double. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's super hard. Yeah. So the same way that like women are having expectations, a lot, a lot to do with porn too, about mm -hmm. like my tits should be this size yeah. or my vagina. My waist should yeah. be like this. Yeah. My bubble should, should be wet like all the time or whatever. Yeah. That's yeah. not realistic. Yeah. I agree with it's, that. None of that's realistic. Yeah, and everybody gets off a different way. That's yeah. the cool thing about yep. sex is that we're all unique. Yeah. And our sexual identity is like our fingerprint. Yeah. So you and I aren't going to experience it in the same way. So it's not one size fits yeah, all. Yeah, that's very cool. But that's, you're made to feel like it is one size fits all. Yeah, but then who is this invisible person who's yeah. making us to feel all these yeah, things? No. Who is that? Exactly. So that's why we got to like reframe huh. all of this. Super interesting. So you have a sh you have a partnership with Pornhub. Pornhub. I directed a PSA series for them okay, got earlier it. this year. That's interesting. Yeah. How'd you do it? Um, well, we do a lot of partnerships. Like okay. Gucci, for example, okay. uh, sponsored the last season of our podcast. That's amazing. Yeah. So we kind of go high low. So okay. we've done partnerships with like HBO, Hulu, Matches Fashion, the yep. Freeze Art Fairs, Gucci, okay. um, Pornhub. Yep. Um, because I think that in my space, you have to acknowledge pornography. Huh. And I would rather be a voice of talking about porn literacy. The yep. series of PSAs that I directed, and I was in one of them, that was costumed by my friend Heidi Bivens, who did okay. the costumes for Euphoria. Okay, amazing. So it was a total okay. Hollywood set okay. and fully clothed. Mm -hmm. We were talking about consent and cybersecurity. Hmm. Because actually, they have better safety practices than all on Pornhub. Mm -hmm, than all of the like um, other user-generated content. Sites, I'm sure they have like to. Like Meta, Google, yeah, I'm et sure they have to. YouTube, which are all yeah. user-generated yeah. content yeah. sites. Yeah. Yeah. Like the last report that came out, it was something like um, I think they had like 13,000 instances of complaints and abuse versus 23.1 million. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. But because they're, you know, it's sex, yep. they're the ones that are thrown under the bus. Yeah, of where, course. I don't know, it's like dirty. I personally yeah. have been like harassed so many times yep. on like Instagram. Yeah, of course. And it's impossible to get anything done. Yeah, now no. it's a little bit better, but that's like only relatively recently. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So on Pornhub, they're very sensitive to harassment. Yeah, they're doing, they're actually doing a lot. It's very easy to get things because basically there's enough free porn in the world. They don't want, they don't, it's a, they don't benefit from having like non-consensual porn on the platform. Hmm. It's not good for business. For them, yeah. Or the brand. No. Yeah. So they, that gets taken down so immediately. So they snip it out very quickly. It's really, really easy. Where huh. it's a lot harder to get things taken down off of YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or exactly. whatever. That's interesting. Yeah. What do you think about OnlyFans? I, um, I had some conversations with them. Yeah. Uh, they, they were interested in having the sex out on the platform, but they told me that they were not a platform for, um, 
sex work or they're getting away from sexual content. I'm like, but you built that platform on the back of yeah. sex workers. So I don't think you can yeah, how do you throw them under the that? bus. Yeah. Um, my friend, uh, Riley Reed, who's one of the top. That's interesting. Horse. You would describe people on OnlyFans as sex workers. I think that sex. Yeah. I w I mean, so not everybody on OnlyFans, but like, I think that, I think that the, like, if you get paid for semi clad pictures of yourself, do you think that that's sex work? Well, there's something called the hierarchy. Okay. Okay. So the hierarchy, imagine it like a pyramid, right? Okay. And at the top you would have like, um, yeah, someone who does like pinup photography. Okay. And then you have like cam girls. Um, then you have like strip te strippers. Okay. And depending on whether like they have the exotic dancer mm -hmm. band or okay. like burlesque who don't okay. have contact with customers. Okay. Or you have people that do have contact with customers, and then it keeps going down. So at the lowest level, you have like street based sex workers. Okay, got it. Okay. So it's all like some degrees of it and whether okay. somebody wants to claim that or not, but mm. it is an economy around sex. Yeah, it sure. is a business. It's massive business. Yeah. So like my friend Riley Reed, who's one of the top adult stars in the world, she has like over a billion views of Pornhub. She makes bank on OnlyFans. I'm and she sure has she crushes this genius it. operation that I write about in the book for rating dick pics. Oh, okay. What I had to it? explain this to one of my older brothers who's okay. like super square. And he was like, I don't understand. Like, why would someone send someone a dick pic? I'm like, oh my oh God. That um, we have so much to catch <laughs> yeah. up on. I don't know where to start. Yeah, yeah, because we all, like, a lot of us get unsolicited dick yeah. pics, right? Mm -hmm. So she has a thing where she charges you to rate your dick. And it's somewhere between like $1 and $3. Stop. So can you imagine how much money? that someone like her is making. So she's like a G I would say she's a genius business woman. Of course. She's an incredible entrepreneur. So she's like, send me your dick pic. You pay me $3 and, and I'll I'm rate it. Say it's like a seven, two. Yeah. And I'll maybe I'll tell you like, oh, like the color. And then like do they it's... screenshot it and they they're proud of it? Well, I don't know what they do with it, but I think, you hmm. know, it's like you get to engage with your favorite. It's like star. the good housekeepings. Look, exactly. That's it's so kind of interesting. Like, yeah, I totally went. Good to, for her. Yeah. I mean, I think it's smart. I learned the adult webmasters were the first to monetize the internet. Oh, I mean, the, the internet was like, I remember I worked at Fidelity Investments and Google would always come to Boston. Okay, Google, this was the beginning of Google. Yeah. And I was like, why is Google in Boston so much? All the f porn companies are in Massachusetts and they were just on the way to see the porn companies. Like, porn built the internet. Porn built the internet. And that's why we need to have porn literacy. Yeah, for sure. So we have the skills to understand that what we're seeing yeah. is like not real. Yeah. It's entertainment and to think critically about yeah, it. Yeah, sure. The way they, we do about like the food we eat. The or news the other... you read. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. But we just want it all to exist in the darkness. Yeah, 100%. Like, don't talk about it. Don't talk yeah. about it until Everybody all of watches our rights it. are taken yeah, away. that's right. And we're like, how did this happen? Yeah, that's... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Wait, are you not allowed to say the word prostitute anymore? We, we try to say sex worker. Okay. Yeah. Why? Um, just because it's like a kind of a slang term that was it, prostitute used to is like derogatory de to denigrate women. Okay, you know, so it's yeah. kind of like reframing language. But at the same time, I do want to say this about where we're at with like updating nomenclature, yeah. like words so fast, is that I think that there's like a lot of performative wokeness. Okay, and I think that if we don't give people the opportunity to like oh, here's why we wouldn't say that. Yeah. Like, to ask those questions yeah. openly. Like, in my corner of the internet, there's these people called super woke. I call them super woke social justice warriors. Oh, yeah. And they come at me. SJWs. No matter why? Yeah, exactly. why would they come after you? They come if after I us say all day something, long. If I say something like people with penises, right? I have to say people with penises because if I say men, then I have 50% of the audience mad at me. If I... Because they, you're not being inclusive. Yeah. If I say, but what percent? if I say people with penises, then, then the other, other people are just like just call them men. other people mad at me. So hmm. I think I'm like, oh, I'm how so do fucking you over navigate it. that? I think that we're in like I think that's part of the problem of where our country is right yeah. now, where there's such an extreme yeah, divide completely. between right you're and left, doesn't matter and what everybody's you have to say. like in their self-righteous yeah. ideology bubble, hmm. like screaming at each yeah. other. And there's no like middle ground to just like talk about things and say like, cause most of America doesn't have bathrooms that say like his, theirs, yeah. hers, theirs. Like that, you can see that in New York, mm, for you see sure. that in Los LA. Angeles. Yeah. And like, so a lot of the country's just like, oh, I don't understand that, it freaks me out, yeah. so I'm gonna hate it. Hmm. Instead of just like gently being like, here's why, 
like maybe I don't like being called a prostitute. It's yeah. because I was called a prostitute my whole life by people who thought I was ashamed. They yeah. were ashamed of me. Yeah. And so like I that word carries to, that word carries weight for me. Instead of like saying that as a human being, one human being mm-hmm. to another. Mm-hmm. I think like we really are missing the opportunity for conversation yeah. and empathy. Yeah. And like seeing where I don't believe that we're as divided as the algorithm would have us think. No, for sure not. It's it's in the algorithm's interest for people to be divided. Exactly, because this just sells more ads. Right, of course. But that's interesting that you say, I think what's interesting about what you're saying, Liz, is that to have great sex and to feel great about the sex you're having, it's about communication and sharing and being vulnerable Mm -hmm. and honest about that vulnerability and also open yeah. To hearing, you know, what your insecurities may be versus what my insecurities are, what my desires might be versus what yours are. And I think that's what's kind of sad in the world right now is everybody's just in their corner judging everybody else. Totally. Versus having a conversation about like, hey, we may not be that far apart or, hey, we might want to try something new. Let's be open to doing that together. Yeah. I think a lot of us are not as far as far as we mm-hmm. think. And when it comes to insecurity, when you fall in love with someone, you don't fall in love with them for their perfection. Yeah, that's you right. You find it, fall in love with them for their, for their flaws like cute little their, flaws yeah. or like their crooked little teeth. Yeah, their, or how they make you feel. Yeah, yeah, how you make them feel. And it's impossible to keep up that level of like perfection all hmm. the time. But obviously that's what we're like wired to do now because mm-hmm. of social media and sure. everything. It's again, like a performance. That's and interesting. And it's exhausting. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's also not fulfilling, I think. It's, it's not like, fulfilling and it's not sustainable. Yeah, that's right. Um, Liz, where do people find you and follow you and how they do they can, how can they get well, smart can, about this? You can buy the book. You can buy the book. You can also listen to it on audio. I narrated it. Which okay, that's my fun. First time this is my third book, but my first time narrating Did it. Did you like the narration? I liked it. It was really hard. It was challenging. It's exhausting. Yeah, I trained for it. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did like all sorts of vocal exercises. Really? I had my crystals. We were thinking you were a crystal person. (laughs) We saw the cover of this book. We've got a big crystal person here. Oh, yeah. And we're like, she's into crystals. Free your mind and your ass will follow. I love that. That's a good t shirt. Do you have a t shirt? I don't. We have a sex ed t-shirt. Okay, but that's make actually, that as a t-shirt. Well, it is a line from a George Clinton Parliament Funkadelic album. Okay, so well. I'm kind of like cribbing it. But yeah, okay, that's all right. Yeah. Okay. I'm co-opting it, but it is a good t-shirt. It is a great note t-shirt. Note to self. Yeah, note to self. Make um, that. And you can find us at thesexed.com. You can listen to the podcast, The Sex Ed, wherever mm-hmm. you stream podcasts. And you can find us on Instagram at The Sex Ed and me at Goldilocks G. Ooh, I love that. All right. Thank you for thank doing you this. Thank you so much. This is so great. All right, so that was Liz. Here were my biggest takeaways. Um, One is just how smart it is to have a conversation about sex before you're having it. Two, to do it sober and with your clothes on, which I just think is great advice in general in life. Three is like the parallels in feeling vulnerable or insecure or afraid to say something. Those vulnerabilities exist in business and they also exist in the bedroom. And then I think what she's trying to do is really interesting in terms of how she's trying to take a taboo subject and to educate people and inform people and also be accepting of people at the same time. So thanks to Liz for joining us. All right, so speaking of being clothed when you're having an intimate conversation about sex, may I recommend to you that you wear Travis Matthew. So Travis Matthew right here, I've got the hoodie. It's awesome. It's in a like sky tie-dye print. Pretty amazing. Nice little logo, very subtle. Um, So if you're going to have an intimate conversation or a difficult conversation or an embarrassing conversation, let's be clothed and be sober. But also, let's feel comfortable and great, and that's what Travis Matthew does. So they make high-quality clothing. They now make it for women, which is amazing. So the women can be clothed and the men can be clothed if you're having a conversation with someone of a different sex. You can go to travismatthew.com and use code TOKENCEO for 20% off. So that's Travis Matthew, not Matthews, T-R-A-V-I-S-M-A-T-H-E-W.com code token CEO for 20% off. They make awesome gear for women. It's durable. It's comfortable. It's easy to wear. It looks good. What more can you ask for? TravisMatthew.com token CEO, 20% off. All right. So let's move to the boardroom. Here's what's happening. I'm obsessed with the Elon Twitter thing. I can't get enough of it. It's like I used to read Kara Swisher when she wrote All Things D and I worked at Yahoo and you 
basically read Kara Swisher before you went to work every day to find out what was happening at work every day. Like Kara Swisher had it before any HR person at Yahoo ever had a piece of news or a piece of gossip or an org change or somebody leaving or something changing. And now I feel the same way about Twitter, but what's amazing is I'm reading about it on Twitter. So people I think are infinitely curious about what Mus what Musk is going to do. There's obviously a huge reaction to it. Dave's dad's now off Twitter. So a lot of celebrities, a lot of people thinking, that Musk is going to take Twitter, turn it into like a MAGA playground. They don't wanna be a part of it. They don't like what he stands for. All super understandable. What I am liking though about it is how decisive he is. I think that he is a really, really aggressive leader and manager. And one thing in media companies versus a tech company or a space company is media companies are kind of like loosey goosey. It's all who you know, it's networking. It's like, it's a lot of fluff sometimes. And I feel like Musk is going in there and he's like, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired. You're going to be fired on Saturday. You're going to be fired on Sunday. So pretty ruthless, but also fairly necessary. Twitter is 7,500 employees. Musk is clearly going to change the product overall. I think he already has people working on it. I was thinking about it the other night. I'm like, he's got a bu literally a bunch of rocket scientists. And then there's a bunch of like woke media people in San Francisco. And he's like, uh, you rocket scientists from Texas, why don't you go to San Francisco, redesign the homepage in five minutes, figure out the business plan in 10 minutes. And it'll be interesting to see culturally what happens at Twitter, but also it will be interesting to what happens materially with the product itself. I think something leaked this week about how it's gonna cost $20 a month to get your verification. I think that's bananas, like $20 a month is a lot. Speaking of Kara Swisher, she had a great rant on it where she's like, I pay like this much for Netflix and this much for Apple and this much for Disney Plus and this much for cable and this much for news. And none of those things equal 20 bucks. So 20 bucks for a verification, I think is kind of bullshit, but maybe there's something else that will go along with it. I also read that Musk is bringing back Vine, which is very, very smart in my opinion. If you look at all the other social media companies are chasing TikTok and the desire for short form video is prevalent. Twitter was so early on that actually and then just fucked it up. So it'll be interesting to see if he brings that back. So anyways, I'm watching that kind of obsessively. I'm in Chicago this week. We have a bunch of meetings. I'm meeting with the outdoor guys. Like what are we doing with Barstool Outdoors, which I'm curious about. I'm going to go on Eddie's podcast, so we'll see how that goes. I'm curious to talk to Eddie, especially since the flame out from the Dave Portnoy show. We have our upfront, so I think we have about 130 advertising partners who are coming to our bar, which is pretty cool. Um, we're going to talk to them about what 2023 is going to look like. Big Cat's coming. KFC and Fights are going. I think um, Sydney Wells will be there. Eddie and co. will be there. So I'm excited about that. Um, we're meeting with a bunch of clients. So I'm excited to, to go see the folks at Fusion. I'm excited to go to Molson Coors. So it should be a pretty great week. All right. So let's move into... All right. First, let's talk about Shady Rays really quickly. So I love Shady Rays. Here's my Shady Rays case. I use this to clean every pair of glasses that I have. My glasses are always dirty. Are your glasses always dirty? Ugh. My glasses are always dirty. It's like my fingerprints are all over them. But... What I love about Shady Rays, I have my Shady Rays here. I have my Shady Rays here. So what I love about my Shady Rays is they're super durable. I can clean them with the case. Who doesn't love that? They're also insanely affordable. So I can buy a lot of sunglasses, which is good because they're either at the bottom of my bag or I lose them. And they give you a money back guarantee if you break them or lose them. So if you go to ShadyRays.com, who doesn't love Shady Rays? That's ShadyRays.com and you use code TOKEN, you can get 50% off two pairs or more. So one, great selection, huge amount of sunglasses. Two, you know that they're durable and they're gonna last you a long time. Three, they're affordable so you can buy multiple pairs. Go to shadyrays.com and use code TOKEN for 50% off two or more pairs. So speaking of Twitter, speaking of layoffs, there were two guys, two, uh, two, two men trolled the media One's last name was Ligma and the other's was Johnson. So Ligma Johnson, ha ha ha, that's like so 11, so like 11 year old humor, it hurts, but kind of ties our episode together. Speaking of sex and speaking of layoffs, these guys pretended that they were laid off Twitter employees. The media obviously fell for it. They interviewed the guys and now it's turned out that it's been a huge, huge hoax. So in honor of those two, our first question is, 
how do I know if I'm at risk for a layoff? What are the warning signs that you should look for? This is a great question. Um, I think the worst thing with a layoff is when you're like, whoa, what just happened? You always, I think, want to be, ha- I think you always want to have your bearings at work. Like, are things going well? Are things going not well? How's the company doing? Does it seem like you're making money or does it seem like you're cutting cost all the time? So I think when you're at risk for a layoff, here, here's how I would walk down that path. One, you should have a sense of how's the company doing. Like when you hear your executives talk or you read any public information about your company or you listen, if it's a public company, you listen listen to the earnings, you should be able to get a sense of like, are you in the red or are you in the green? If things are in the red and your, your company's losing money or you're hearing things like consumers aren't buying our products or our foot traffic is down or our growth is less than it was last year, those are the warning signs that your company could be thinking about layoffs. Generally, when the profit, when the revenue of a company goes down and the profit goes down, the biggest expense that most companies have is headcount, so obviously that's when the layoffs kind of enter the chat. So the first is pay attention to what's happening at your company. The second is think about if your group is fat or not. Everybody knows if their group is fat or not. If your group is fat, it means that you have multiple people who do the same job. You can leave work at four o'clock every day and nobody notices. There's no stress of too much work happening. You're basically like mailing it in or coasting or you're not very challenged or you don't feel stressed. Um, Not that stress means that your group is going well. There could be a whole host of other issues there. But in general, if your group is kind of bloated, your group is probably ripe for a layoff. The third is, do you work in a part of the company that makes money or not? The last people to get laid off, in my experience, are the people that make money. When you're seeing warning signs in your company, you also gotta pay attention to where you work. Are you a cost to the company or are you a revenue driver for the company? I was always really paranoid about this and I always wanted to be on the revenue side of things just so that if there were a layoff that I wouldn't be affected. Um, I was laid off once and it was really kind of a, debil- it, it was a upsetting experience and I was like, ooh, I never wanna be laid off again. Now, employees don't control when they get laid off or not. I certainly don't control that in my life, but if you can find yourself on the make money side of the equation, you're probably in the best possible position to not get laid off. But if you heed the warning signs, then you can get ahead of it. So if you're seeing that your company isn't doing great, if you're noticing that your group is kind of bloated, if you recognize that you're on the non-money making side of the house, it's a good idea to get your resume together and to get ahead of it. One of the things that's happening in New York right now is that all of the major media companies are laying off people, right? CNN's laying off people, Bleacher Report's laying off people, Discovery's laying off people, mostly CNN people and Warner people. If you are a salesperson or an account manager right now looking for a job, it sucks because there's there's hundreds, if not thousands of those types of people in New York City looking for work right now. Same with Twitter people. You want to get ahead of the layoff. You want to be able to get out there, put your resume out there before there's 30 other people like you doing the same exact thing. So that's my two cents there. All right, second question. After losing your job, what are the things to focus on in your next job search? Look, having been laid off, I think losing your job sucks. You wanna give yourself like 24, 48, 72 hours to like lick your wounds. You're gonna lie in bed, you might call your mom or your dad, you're gonna feel badly about yourself. Maybe you eat like too many cheeseburgers or drink too many drinks or you go out and stupidly get drunk in the afternoon with your friends because you can. Give yourself that that window to just feel like shit. I think it's an important, it's an important moment. Um, obviously there's a lot to worry about. You gotta worry about your bills. You gotta worry about when rent is due or your college loans or how you're gonna pay for your car, like your credit card debt. Like you gotta worry about all that stuff, but give yourself a moment to feel sad and to process all those feelings or at least recognize that you're having those feelings. I think then the next thing is getting laid off from a job is not the worst thing ever. It's an opening, it's maybe a door that you didn't open yourself, but somebody else opened for you and you have the chance to walk through it. So in this case, figure out where you wanna go. Do you wanna turn left down the street or do you wanna turn right down the street? And I think the right way to do that 
is to think about what did you love in your job? Like, what did you absolutely love to do in this last job? What was your favorite part about it? What were you really good at? What did you enjoy learning about? What was your greatest contribution? And then when you think about what your next job is, make sure that the next job or the jobs you pursue have those things as part of that job description. This is a huge opportunity for you to think about a new company, a new city, a new type of role, a new type of company, a new sector, a new industry. Like, It's a great, amazing opportunity to think about doing something different, maybe to make a crazy left turn in your career or take a totally different path. But in order to do that, you know, one is take the moment to be sad and feel like shit so it doesn't kind of linger with you. And then second, with a clear head, figure out what you like to do and go about aggressively pursuing a job that has those attributes to it. What should you do when all companies in your industry are in a hiring freeze? Hmm. Okay, heads up, most companies are going to be in hiring freezes. Like the, the economy's hitting the skids, inflation is through the roof, the government is having a hard time bringing it down, there's supply chain issues, there's unrest in the world, the climate's on fire, like it is doom and gloom out there. Also, I saw this on Barstool Sports, if the Phillies win, the last time, every time the Philly wins a, wins a World Series, we go into a recession. So like start rooting for the Astros might be my first biggest piece of advice there. So the biggest thing is a lot of companies are gonna go into hiring freezes. Um, I'm thinking about this right now for Barstool where we're on fire. We're growing faster than everybody else in our in our sector. We're doing so profitably. Like we have a good thing going on. But as a manager and as a CEO, it's easier to not hire people than to lay people off. And I don't ever want to be in a position or I want to avoid as much as possible being in a position to lay people off. So the best way to do that is to slow down or freeze the hiring. If you're in an industry, let's say take the media industry, most most companies are definitely in a hiring slowdown, possibly in a total hiring freeze. If companies are in a hiring freeze in your industry, it means it's going to be hard to bop around and get or interview for and get a new job. So the best thing you can do is to hunker down, hunker down and make the most of the job you have now. It's kind of a funny thing, I think, for people because the Great Recession was happening where everybody could get a job everywhere and there was thousands, you know, people felt like they had thousands of offers or people felt that they had hundreds of offers or dozens of offers and everything was bright and there was great mobility and you could jump from this job to this job to this job and get a pay raise every time. That's not gonna be the case for 2023, maybe 2024, maybe 2025. So, you know, my advice would be the best thing you can do is to make the most of your job that you have now, make sure you have job security in the job that you have now, build that resume, and then when the world starts to open up, then get out there early to go find what that next gig is. So, all right, last question for us is, if you are laid off, how do you explain that in your cover? How do you explain that in your cover letter or on your resume? Look, I don't think you need to say that you were laid off on your cover letter. Like, I really don't. I don't think you also, I don't think you need to put it on your resume. You worked from your company from this date to this date. Um, and now you're looking for a new opportunity. Now, if you are traveling in a small circle or you're in a smaller industry, um, it's probably fairly obvious, especially if there's been a big layoff, that you were part of a layoff. Um, at which point, if somebody asks you, like, "Hey, why did you leave? Why did you leave your company? Why did you leave Barstool Sports? Why did you leave Warner Media? Why did you leave CNN?" I think it's totally acceptable to say, "Hey, I was part of a restructuring. The company, you know, was cutting this much cost every quarter. My group was heavily affected. You know, as a result, I'm starting to look at all sorts of new opportunities." Because you were laid off, it doesn't mean you weren't great at your job. And because you were laid off, it doesn't mean that your group was viable or smart or needed or necessary or high functioning at the company. If you take CNN, for example, I think this quarter I heard they're trying to take, I think we talked about this, like $75 million out of the PL. And next quarter, they're going to take $250 million out of the PL. When you have to cut $250 million out of your PL, there's a lot of jobs that are going to be lost. The, those loss of jobs have nothing to do with an individual person's performance. It, it, it has to do with the company taking a massive amount of cost off the table. 
So my recommendation would be like, don't hide from it. Don't, you don't need to advertise it. It's not, you know, who you are isn't, there's not, you're not wearing like, I was, I was laid off on your t-shirt. Although that might be a funny t-shirt to make. Like, don't advertise it. Don't lead with it. But don't hide from it either. You know, hey, I'm looking for a new job. I worked at this company. They had a massive restructuring and a layoff. I was part of that. It gave me the opportunity to rethink what I want to be doing. And I'm really excited about pursuing this. That's kind of how I would tackle it. Speaking of hiring, firing, laying off, managing employees, let's talk about JustWorks. JustWorks is great because it helps small businesses manage their employees. It's a super easy, it's an intuitive platform. It takes the guesswork out of employment, tax regulations, and requirements. It makes it so easy to hire and manage remote employees across all 50 states. It helps you as the manager or the CEO or the HR person set up sick leave policies, administering harassment and discrimination preventing training, prevention trainings. It helps save time on tracking and managing payroll. I can tell you payroll is a colossal pain in the butt. Plus, you can access expert support 24-7 and you can tap into certified HR consultants. If you go to justworks.com slash pricing, you can get details and you can take a look at JustWorks transparent pricing by visiting justworks.com slash pricing. That's justworks.com slash pricing for details. Okay, so closing, closing thoughts for us. I guess what I would say, closing thoughts. I'm reading this book called The Growth Mindset, which I actually really like. Um, and the growth mindset, I'm just at the beginning of it. The growth mindset talks about there's really two types of people in life. Um, there are people who have growth mindsets and there are people who have fixed mindsets. Growth mindset people um, can be very hard on themselves, but they're always striving to learn. They want to put themselves out there. They want to uh, learn how to do new things. When they're presented with an obstacle or a problem or a mistake or a failure, they seize that opportunity as an opportunity to learn and to grow. That's a growth mindset. Fixed mindset people don't like change. They want things exactly the way they are, exactly the way they've always been. They, they feel comfort and security in that. But when they do encounter a mistake or there is an obstacle or something goes wrong or they screw up, they tend to blame everyone else and they tend to feel kind of capsized by the problem. So if you, you know, imagine you're like staring at a big obstacle in your way, maybe it's a layoff. The fixed mindset is like, oh shit, management sucks. My company sucks. My boss sucks. Everybody sucks. God hates me. And you feel daunted and overpowered by the obstacle. And the growth mindset person is like, oh shit, that sucked, but I'm going to overcome. I'm going to climb the mountain. I'm going to take this opportunity to learn and be more aggressive and, or, you know, to learn and get better. And I think that's kind of the biggest thing. If you're staring down a layoff or you're staring down obstacles in your company, look, everyone who is in a workplace right now, I think is going to face obstacles. Um, I think the economy is tightening. I think we're going to see pressure on people's financials in a way that we just haven't seen in a long time. And frankly, for most people new to the workforce that you've seen ever. And so as a result, you're going to have the choice of like, there's going to be problems. Everybody has problems in their life. Everybody has fuck ups in their life. Everybody trips and falls. But are you going to get up, learn from it, and run differently or run faster or run better or take more steps forward? Or are you gonna kind of like curl up and be, be bitter and negative and stationary after you, after you meet that obstacle? And I think that's kind of true in a layoff, which is, you know, hey, companies are gonna freeze hiring. Companies are gonna start laying off people. Companies already have started laying off people. It sucks, it's shitty, it makes you feel bad about yourself, it's kind of demoralizing, you feel ashamed. 
give yourself the peace to like feel badly for a little bit, eat like junk food, get drunk, whatever you need to do. Um, but then use the opportunity to go make a new future for yourself. Like there's going to be another tomorrow. There's going to be another job. There's going to be another promotion. There's going to be another raise in your future. Maybe it's not from the place you thought it was going to be from, but that's not a bad thing. Go out and find that new opportunity. Seize the part of yourself that wants growth and wants to evolve. And I think if you do that, then you kind of think about your life and your career as a journey. And sometimes you have moments that are really high and sometimes you have moments that are really low. But overall, you're going to be very happy with your journey because you've come from one place to the next. So that's kind of my closing thoughts today. We'll see you back here next week. And that's it. <laughs>